meant to situate myself this morning, but it's a Friday, and for some reason that feels like a Monday to me. <laughs> no, I am. Um, by the end of the week, I'm just, you know, it's the end of the week, and we're all ready to rest. So, today is the Friday Q&A tea time, and, um, fix my collar there, because that bugs me, <laughs> and my dress and everything else going on. Um, I'm going to make some tea while <laughs> we wait for everybody to show up, so it just gives people time to roll in. Um, this morning I'm going to make this, um, Anjai green tea from Yunnan Sourcing. She smells nice, and she's very pretty. Doesn't take a whole lot. See? I had somebody be like, you said what, oh, for one of my recipe videos, they're like, you said white tea, but that tea looks green to me. <laughs> the thing to know about white tea and green tea and black tea is they're all from the same tea plant. And um, white tea doesn't mean that the plant itself is colored white. It's just when they pick it. Right. Um, so that's always funny to me. Especially when people say stuff with such confidence. They're like, oh, you must be mistaken because that tea looks green. And I'm like, <laughs> like, no. No, I didn't say it couldn't be the color green. I said that it's when it was picked. <laughs> hey, everybody. Everybody's showing up to me talking shit. No, it's all right. I'm having an odd morning. I woke up a little dissociated and I think my glutamate levels have climbed up, which is why I'm grabbing a green tea instead of a white tea, although um, the L-theanine and white tea works just as well. But I find that the green tea works a little faster when I do it that way. So, okay, so today is the Friday Q&A. Good morning, everybody, for rolling in. Um, who are rolling in? I'm going to be extra human today. <laughs> um, I got some sleep last night and I know everybody wants to see the puppy. <laughs> I'm just kind of, I'm just kind of waiting. I'm letting her settle in. I'm letting myself settle in and then, um, I'll have them bring this big creature that will not be a little fluffy. I mean, she's very fluffy, but people are like, oh, I bet she's really small. <laughs> like she was like 25 pounds at the vet yesterday at about 10 weeks. So she's a big girl. Um, but yeah, as soon as my tea is done, we'll start the Q and A, but you know, um, I like to let people roll in. Um, said, good morning, April. I was going to name my business Walla Walla Herbs, but you inspire me to call it Wallula Herbs. Do you mind? Um, if you know that there's a town called Wallula, <laughs> just so you know, like, that's a town, right, outside of Walla Walla, um, and I just have always liked the name, but yeah, I don't mind if you call your business Wallula Herbs. Um, but I, um, but yeah, I've always, I've always liked the name and I was going to name a kid that at some point, <laughs> but, uh, I'm not having no more kids. I'm always like holding on to kid names, which I'm like, eh, I'm, my youngest is about to turn 17 and when she turns 18, I'll be 40. So I'm like, <laughs> no more babies. So I named the puppy Walula, you know? Um, yeah, I did get some rest. Um, tonight is my shift for the puppy. I can hear her barking pretty good because I'm guessing what happened right now is my son brought his dog in without realizing that I'm doing a morning tea time. So you get to hear the puppy. <laughs> um, but um, anyhow, she'll calm down in a second. She takes her job very seriously. Yesterday, uh, <laughs> we went to the vet and did a bunch of errands in town and like um, she has just decided like like they're very serious guard dogs like so at 10 weeks she's like get away from my car get away from my car <laughs> from like anybody walking by you know like I'm like that is not a puppy someone's gonna steal you know um, but yeah as soon as this tea is done and I'm, I'm ready to go. I'll let people know when they can ask their questions for today's q and A. I am um, I'm going to try to be a little quicker answering questions today because I know, I know that I can get, um, oh, she smells nice. I know that I can get, um, lost in the details and giving like a hyper, like complex reply, which there's nothing wrong with that. But at the same time, I know that it means I don't answer a lot of people's questions. And if I don't answer your question today, do know that I have literal hours 
hours of of Q and A's that you can go and rewatch, and so I've probably answered a similar question to yours over the years. Um, okay. Very nice. It's it's really faint, but vegetal. I also didn't brew it really strong because I wasn't in the mood for a lot of tannins. Today I'm drinking this, um, I can never, this is a big complex name. I'm just calling it Angie. It's Angie Ba Cha Green Tea of Zay Jing. I'm just going to hold it up to the screen and you can screenshot it if you want. <laughs> I'm not going to pretend it's like, I don't try to pretend like I can pronounce things correctly because that just gets you in trouble. I'm like, no, but it's really tasty. Okay, so let's jump into the Q&A. You're going to hear a puppy bark in the background and that's just part of my existence <laughs> right now. Um, when she's older, it'll be a bigger, scarier sound and bark. Um, if you have a question, I want you to comment question in all caps on the live if you're re-watching this hi future person you don't need to scream question at me i'll see the comment but say question and then your question all right um let's see how can i cure leg and foot cramps please so um there's a lot of things that could be going on if you're having cramps in your muscles um and your legs and things like that i would highly suspect that you're short in electrolytes you probably need to increase the potassium in your diet you're probably low in magnesium all these things are really suspect um when it comes to having like leg cramps or even um rls like restless leg syndrome but Supplementing with potassium is kind of dangerous because it's very easy to overdo it and like too much potassium is just as dangerous for your heart as not enough. Um, and so I would suggest drinking things like coconut water, eating bananas, tomato juice, tomatoes in general have a lot of potassium in them. Um, you could find an electrolyte drink, but I wouldn't eat super potassium rich diet and then take something that has potassium added to it synthetically. That's a, a recipe for disaster. Um, but you could also make, um, for the magnesium, check out my magnesium oil video. It's literally made out of water. There's no real oil in it, but they just call it that. Super easy to make. You could apply that topically. It would probably help with your cramps. And I like getting my magnesium topically versus internally because gut health issues and things like that really stop it from absorbing versus when you put it on transdermally on your skin, it gets right to the tissues where you're needing it. Um, so question, varicose veins on legs during pregnancy. That is a hard one because your body, your whole body is under like pressure right now. And there's not a whole lot of herbs um, that I would feel comfortable telling you to take during pregnancy. Um, topically, um, you could use things like witch hazel to try to get the, um, the veins to tighten up. But I would also consider making sure that I was eating a lot of really vitamin K1 and K2. They're two different things. Rich foods. K1 comes from like leafy greens that are cooked well i'd make sure that i was eating it alongside dairy if you can tolerate dairy um our fats you really need fats to absorb and and um, these fat soluble vitamins like vitamin k vitamin k2 comes from like butter cheese meat basically when the ruminant animal eats the grass they convert it in their like digestive like fermentation system that we don't have and it turns it into K2 and then it's stored in their meat, right? So when you eat that, it's kind of like asking the animal to already convert it for you, which is fantastic. But vitamin K, a lot of people just think about it for um, calcium absorption if they think about it at all. But it's also really, really important to vascular health, heart health, blood pressure, mental health. Vitamin K is really, really underutilized and overlooked. Um, Question, how to know what herbs won't interact with medications? Sad to say I'm on quite a few, including one for Fib. There are a couple ways to go about this. The first thing, just so you have like the instinct in your mind to think about it. Does this herb I'm taking have similar actions to the medication I'm taking? Right? If I have low or high blood pressure and I'm taking a high blood pressure medication and this herb 
also lowers like hibiscus lowers blood pressure if i take these two together what will happen what will happen is your blood pressure will probably go too low right so you can use that with anything if i'm on um a medication that stimulates my immune system and we need it to be higher and i take this herb that also stimulates my immune system or do they contradict each other let's say you're um just a little hair floating around bugging me <laughs> let's say you are on something for an autoimmune condition where you're trying to lower your immune system if you then took an herb that was going to raise your immune system it would be contraindicated right like you're trying not to like mix and match like that um, the next thing you can look at is, does this herb increase my liver function? And a really amazing example here is St. John's wort. People think that St. John's wort interacts with medications, and she is one that you really can't take if you're on any medications whatsoever. But it's not that she interacts with the medication, it's that she speeds your liver's capacity to process out toxins from your blood, which even if we need the medicine, our body sees it as a toxin, right? So what she does is she gets the medication out of your system really rapidly. It can make you go into withdrawal from psychiatric medication. It can make you go into withdrawal from like, you know, you can get the blood pressure medicine out of your body. It can get, sometimes birth control people talk about it, but I'm not quite sure about that one because it's more hormone related. But that's how St. John's Wort works. Now, the only one that she's also contraindicated for would be uh, SSRIs because St. John's Wort really jacks up your serotonin. Um, over the years, I just, I don't like to use her internally unless I have to because of that reason. Um, but if you're on a medication that's already making your serotonin sky high, and then you take another medication that makes your serotonin go sky high, you end up with serotonin syndrome. Um, but beyond that, uh, you can also look up the name of your medication alongside um, the common name and then try the Latin name or the scientific name of the plant to see if anything pops up. So it's really about, does this do the same thing as my medication and will it become too effective and harm me? Does this, uh, like go against the medication I'm using in some way or does this speed up my liver a bunch and is there a possibility that it will strip the medication out of my body people always ask me like specific like can I take this medication I'm like there are literally millions of medications so at this point we have to kind of just look at how these things may or may not interact in our body with our medication and always be looking it up now the good news is if an herb um, is really known like St. John's wort for contraindications, it, you'll find a list of medications that you typically can't take with it. Um, so, let's see. Question, did you see anything interesting on a walk? I've seen all kinds of interesting things on a walk. Um, usually it's just nature related or like weird, creepy stuff deep in the forest related. <laughs> you know, like I've seen like, like one time we were like, easily like two three hours back in the cuts and like somebody had built i didn't touch it for sure they had basically built like it was very like blair witchy but made out of a bunch of like elk bones and like i'm like oh not the fuck going that way <laughs> you know i've seen stuff like that i think the creepiest thing i've ever come across and i've told the story before um we were driving over this like very hard to drive over a mountain road and I'm talking we're in like uh this jeep we owned at the time was like a forest service jeep so it was like meant to go off road and we were having hard time on these roads right and we were like an hour and a half two hours up this mountain trying to drop into the backside of some property and we are like bottoming out and I'm like I'm nervous driving these roads right they're they're forest service roads but I wouldn't call them I mean they're roads <laughs> right at some point they were they were logging roads right and then people abandon them and they keep using them and we get to the top of this barely making it in our jeep and out of fucking nowhere there are two people they're sitting in a fucking golf cart a golf cart not a four-wheeler not something a golf cart this place this thing could not go forward or backward to get anywhere they were in plaid shirts like bright red plaid shirts and had fucking like bow ties on and they had um like straw hats and their skin was like like a person who's there's no other way to say it that's like lived in arizona their entire life and has done nothing to like protect it it was like leather 
but like really dark but also shiny and they both exactly went like this as we drove by there was no waving there was no nothing and every fucking every i am a prey animal instinct in my body as well as my husband's were like holy fuck holy fuck holy fuck holy fuck they came from nowhere there was no house up there there was no camp and i'm like that's what happens like when you catch aliens or some shit and they just were like oh quick look human and they're like and i'm like okay but you look human from like the 1920s it was fucking terrifying we never we have never gone over that road again i know that there's all kinds of like really amazing herbs up there but we have never never gone up there again um um let's see question best herb supplements to take for hashimoto's the thing that's interesting about hashimoto is if you deep dive into ebv which is the epstein-barr virus um there's a bunch of people who believe that hashimoto's is actually a symptom of like a like ebv like deeply embedding itself into your thyroid um but i also think that honestly it can be a symptom of um like being exposed to a lot of bromide and like dough conditioners, which pushes iodine out of your thyroid. And so I would consider looking into herbs like self heal, lemon balm, cycling through things that specifically attack like um, herpes type viruses, which you're like, wait, you just said EBV, but it's in the same family, right? Um, so if you start working on like potentially lowering like the EBV load in your body, um, and then you could start working with like seaweed infusions to start, um, increasing the iodine in your body now i know that there's a big misconception that like iodine will like create hashimoto's but that is so 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 deeply incorrect i would look into like the iodine protocol um i would go very slow i don't like to take isolated iodine i like getting it from seaweed instead because nature knows what she's doing right so if you're making an infusion you get all the nutrients that you need at once um but you have to go slow because it can really make you feel like shit when you start to detox out like the bromide that um that competes for area in your thyroid and um i've been really digging into it over the past six months and it's just an interesting interesting subject you could google iodine protocol and come across like a bunch of people that know way more than i do in regards of like how to really go through this and talking about it for hashimoto's and things like that um question what herbs for copd if I was dealing with COPD or any lung health issue, the first thing that I would use like on a consistent basis personally would be molin infusion and molin tincture, right? Molin tea, get molin in your body constantly, right? But if you um, wanna really kick up your game, you could also include um, tiger milk mushroom in that. Um, I know it's a weird name and she's just now becoming more commonly available in the US um, to be able to order. I watched it cure my son's smoke and COVID induced asthma. It was crazy. The doctor was just like, oh, he'll have asthma the rest of his life. I'm like, he never had asthma before. It doesn't matter. He's got it now. Here's some steroids, right? And I'm like, no, I don't accept that. And so we were working heavily with um, Mullen alongside of the tiger milk mushroom and he doesn't have asthma anymore right and he had bad asthma like he couldn't like walk off our driveway and he was like something's wrong you know um so i would definitely look into that i don't know i'm not saying that it can like cure people and he wasn't born with asthma so that was probably a big factor and i know you were asking about copd but it's very very all interconnected into like how we can support it and it's been used for thousands of years and tcm for supporting like lung health um question milk thistle seed what is the best way to use it to support my liver most people turn it into capsules tinctures or tea um the thing that i'll say about milk thistle is you need to go a lot slower than you think milk thistle is great for supporting the liver but she can really make you feel like shit and like I don't like to use the word detox because I don't want people to get the concept that they can clean their liver. Like the detox concept of cleaning the liver is really damaging. It hurts people all the time. It's a billion dollar industry. Um, and so, you know, they're like, yeah, you got to clean it. It's dirty. It's not a filter. It's not really the way your liver works. It's more about um, grabbing nutrients from your gut and passively putting them into your blood and then shunting toxins and things out through your various digestive holes. <laughs> right. But, but, um, milk thistle is really good at like cleaning out like old, like bile and sludge that's like in your gut and things like that. And so it can cause a lot of like 
detox, like into toxin die off symptoms. And so it can really make you feel like shit. So whatever way you decide to start working with it, work with it very small, very small amounts and then work your way up, right? That way you don't just slam yourself all at once. Some people end up vomiting and sweating out and having fevers and then they're like, I'm allergic, but really you were just going too hard too fast, right? Um, question, how to heal from EBV? Didn't know I had it until it resurfaced this January. Continued working even during that time. Any advice? To de dive deeper into EBV, EBV lives off of cortisol. So it likes to attack your thyroid and your adrenal health, right? Because when you are exhausted, she is well fed, right? Because in your body, pumps out cortisol but EBV is also kind of lazy in the way that if your immune system is on point and you're handling like you're working with like stress stress reducing mechanisms and you're handling stress well she lays dormant she can't really break through your immune system until somebody's already opened the door for her so if you got hit with ebv which 98 percent of humans have ebv at this point you didn't even have to get mono in your childhood to get ebv um you were probably born with it because your parent had it Right, and it just it's just one of those things that it has adapted to be in every human body. But you don't find out about it until you're so worn down that your EBV flares up, right? She's like, oh, someone opened the door and I can show up. Now, I talked about self-heal earlier. I really like her for consistent use against EBV. I also like a lot of like of the um like eating a lot of gelatin and the amino acids that are found in there i don't necessarily like taking isolated amino acids but if you get some high quality beef gelatin you could literally just start eating that daily you could make like your favorite juice or something into jello you make jello with it you know you can add it to your smoothies things like that um, I really like that broad range of aminos for helping to repress EBV, but then you've got to get yourself um, in some sort of like stress reduction situation. Start looking at what's going on in your life. Start taking time to be like grounding outside with your bare feet on the ground. Start saying no more often. You know, things like that to help your cortisol levels ramp back down so she can stop feasting right um and generally just like going easier on your body you know the more you push through the ebv the sicker you'll get um because the more you push while you're exhausted the more your stress hormones are up and then the more she eats right so it can become this vicious cycle question uh what causes restless leg twitching magnesium helps but i'd like to ensure my diet is aligned to help as well uh, like i talked about earlier with the cramps it usually comes down to um like you've got an electrolyte imbalance but if you find that you're working really like heavily with electrolytes and it's not working i would start side eyeing b vitamins sometimes you can have muscle twitching and things like that from like a b12 or a b1 deficiency but it's always cool if you have the capacity to the money to or the insurance to cover it to ask for like a comprehensive b panel make sure that they include b1 which is thiamine and act ask them to test for active b12 not just b12 in your serum like let's say you get a b12 test and they're like your number's 400 which is actually pretty low the thing is not all of that is active like it doesn't matter like you might have 400 in your blood but what if only like 50 of it was active right um the best way is a urine test they like it's like an mma test they test for the methylation situation going on in your urine um and uh, that's the dog Let me know something's happening. Usually it's like her reflection in the sliding glass door. <laughs> or like a cat will knock a toy just so and she's like, oh God. <laughs> um, so question, herbs for inflamed and scabby scalp issues. Um, you could make like a, a chamomile tea, like a strong chamomile tea hair rinse. If it's got a lot of itching going on, you could make plantain leaf, the like the plant, not the banana. People always are like the banana. And I'm like, no, it's not even a banana, but no, um, you can make an infusion and rinse your hair with that. You probably have a little bit of a fungal infection going on. A lot of people don't realize that, um, 
like dandruff can be caused by a fungal infection um and so you could also get like some white oak bark and make like a white oak bark infused water to like rinse your scalp with and do that on a consistent basis to kill off the fungus but also if you wear hats you need to wash your hats you need to wash your pillows because what if you kill the fungus and then put the hat back on right it's much like as if you had athlete's foot you can't ever get rid of it if you keep wearing the shoes that you wore when you had athlete's foot but it's easier to wash like hat and bedding than it is shoes um question what sweeteners to use i use honey or sugar or maple syrup i'm not afraid of like pure energy like sugar is just pure energy i'm not talking about corn syrup or any of like the highly processed stuff but like every cell in your body runs on glucose and the only real difference between like cane sugar and like maple syrup and honey is the fructose to glucose levels right some of them are different like if you have um insulin sensitivity issues like if you are have blood sugar issues you'd be better off using something like maple syrup because it has a lower glycemic index compared to honey right but if you aren't worrying with any of that like i use all three right depending on what i'm making but i don't always want something that tastes like maple syrup or honey so i just use a high quality non-gmo cane sugar you know and i'm gonna grow sugar cane this year i had to bring it in the winter time but i mean you can people have like this concept of sugar as something evil right but then they ignore the like 800 other ingredients that are in the thing they're buying and all the rancid seed oils they're like yep it's the sugar that's bad <laughs> and i'm like man out of everything in there the sugar doesn't worry me it's all the other crap that's in it um you know our body needs glucose you know don't live off of it even though your body does right make sure that you're also eating plenty of like proteins and fats too um question help with perimenopause hormonal migraines um i really think that most of the time the symptoms that people deal with when they're going through like pre-menopause or menopause is actually from like a progesterone deficiency right and your estrogen dominant pushes everything down and then you can throw in the fact that like when your estrogen is sky high even though they're like oh but that drops when you're in menopause i'm like yeah it would if we weren't eating nothing but soy in our food all the time it's added in everything you might be like i don't eat soy I'm like, you do. If you're not reading the back of the labels of the things you buy or the chocolate you eat or the everything, you've been eating soy, even if you don't realize it. Soy legions are in everything. Um, but I really like pine pollen and wild yam for this. Now, I also like to use chamomile in conjunction with anything that I'm using hormonal related because chamomile is fantastic for helping us open up like the detox pathways of hormones through our liver, right? I really like her for that. But pine pollen is very specifically loaded with androgens and androgens are basically like male hormones. And I hate that they get labeled that way because as women, we also need androgens. And when you're low on testosterone, you have a low sex drive, you're exhausted, your vagina's dry, all that kind of stuff. But they're like, oh, it's estrogen. I'm like, no, it's really not. Usually it's low testosterone and pine pollen is great for that. And it's not like you're taking actual testosterone that's gonna make you all. <laughs> no, it's like a small amount that naturally occurs. But then wild yam has natural precursors that turn into DHEA and this DHEA is like a master hormone she sits up here and then your body says okay well I'm going to either turn this into estrogen progesterone or testosterone depending on what I need for the most part right so I like that because then your body decides what you're low in your body decides what you need and using them in conjunction is a pretty good way to support your body through you know um, menopause or perimenopause or even if anybody's younger not going through it but having issues with estrogen dominance um so is there an herbal holistic uh, substitute for prednisone? Sorry, I forgot to put question in front. That's okay. Um, you know, when it comes to like trying to mimic steroids, it's a little hard. There are some plants, but they're hard on your liver. And so whenever you're trying to do what a steroid is doing, you're usually talking about knocking down some sort of inflammation. So starting to work with herbs that are consistently lowering inflammation in our body can go a long way, depending on what they're using the shot for, right? If they're using it to lower your immune system, 
that might not be the way you want to go because most herbs that uh, help with inflammation also increase your immune system, right? So it really depends on what you're working with. But I like linden infusion consistently um, for knocking down inflammation in our body. Um, you could also, depending on the type of inflammation, I actually really like alfalfa for inflammation. But I've thought about it over the years, and I think the reason that alfalfa works so good for things like arthritis and stuff is more about the fact that she's loaded with vitamin K right and so i think it almost always comes back to lowering inflammation on top of like re replacing or replenishing the nutrient that we're all lacking in and you'd be surprised how many people are lacking in vitamin k so okay um question do you recommend eating papaya seeds i mean if you're looking for like a digestive enzyme you could if you want to i don't really see anything that's like horrendously wrong with it you know um, and if that's something that you like to do, give it a go, you know, um, but papaya does make a good enzyme, but I'd probably be more interested in eating the papaya herself, <laughs> right? The seeds are okay, but like if, you know, if you can get a hold of fresh, tasty papaya, I'd probably eat that instead because she'll have more of the complexities and sometimes seeds, they, they create like toxins to try to uh, save themselves, right? So I kind of think about that when I don't eat a whole lot of seeds because of that. I do like nuts, but sometimes I, <laughs> they'll get me in the comment section later, but I do like to, um, soak them to help get rid of some of the, like the phytotoxin load. Um, question, do you think, oh, I cannot answer that one. I'm sorry. I mean, I can, I can, but I, it's a tricky, tricky question. Um, do I think a pill that would make something stop and go away would interact with things that you were trying at home to make it go away? It can. I can't say it out loud. I can't say it out loud. If you have been trying to stop this from happening, and you have been taking things, sometimes those things are blood thinners. And then if you took that over the counter, the thing that a doctor gave you to make the thing go away, it could, it could make you bleed, you know? And so it might be a situation to where if I was going to do that, I might go into the office versus taking the pill. Just because they'd be able to control the situation better and, you know, it wouldn't react the same way of the thing that you would take that is naturally going to make you bleed violently. You know, it's something to consider. Um, and it's a hard one to answer. <laughs> you know, a lot of words there will get me in trouble. Um, so let me see, let me miss this. Um, question regarding the prednisone question, um, is it to replace cortisol for adrenal insufficiency? Yeah, it, de it depends on, um, oh, it is to replace cortisol for, okay, so they're using it to replace that. You could, you could really start working on your adrenal health slowly for that, then you would want to see that your numbers were doing really well and you wouldn't want to stop suddenly. You could use things like ginseng is really well for adrenal health. You could also get like, uh, like bovine type, like you can get like anything that you need you can get in animal form. And people are like, oh, you know, but I'm like, yeah, you can get like thyroid from like, you can literally get beef thyroid, right? You know, you can, so you can look at this way to like replace it in your body, but um, I would probably look into like deeply healing the, uh, the adrenals before I started really trying to take out the cortisol because you don't, you don't want to like die of like a, you know, an adrenaline crash, you know, a crisis like that would be horrendous. Um, let's see. Question. This is a weird one, but anything topical for really bad foot calluses, like blister calluses? Um, you could use a comfrey salve, you know, and after you like soaked your feet and used like a pumice stone to get like the, the dead material off, you could start using like a comfrey infused castor oil or a comfrey balm that's going to help, um, stimulate new skin cell development, but also like if they haven't or whoever is dealing with it hasn't dug into why 
Why are your feet acting that way? Our feet are a really big precursor to our health. Sometimes if we've got unchecked diabetes and we don't realize it, or if we've got severe B vitamin deficiencies and don't realize it, we start getting really bad calluses and cracks and issues with our feet. It's why people who are diabetic have to really take care of their feet and those are the first parts they lose if they lose a foot to diabetes, right? Um, and that happens all the time and it happens faster than people realize. Um, you know, cracked feet, blistering feet, huge like buildup of callus when you're not walking around barefoot. Um, it's a big symptom of something else going on. But definitely um, just keeping that dead skin buildup like pushed back like gently with a pumice stone and then using something like comfrey. And even like something deep like with tallow, like comfrey with tallow together would be pretty fantastic. You're trying to keep that skin from from developing that much of a tissue that it's not happy with, right? Um, question, any advice for onset neuropathy? We're gonna go right back to the nutrition aspect. If you don't have diabetes, and you've been checked for it, I'd also then go get your B12 levels and your folate levels checked. Um, that is like hallmark. Like if they're like, oh, we don't know, you just have neuropathy now. <laughs> Please make sure that you are insistent on getting every type of B12 test that you possibly can. Doctors are really ignorant about B12 and it's a huge symptom like burning hands, burning feet, burning mouth. Actually, my mouth started to burn and I was like, what is happening here? At first I thought that I had a histamine intolerance, right? But I found that there were foods that were high in histamine that weren't triggering it. I'm like, what the hell is going on here? And then it was like one in the morning and this was like a year or more ago. I woke up and I was like, oh, it's B12. I don't know. My brain was like, ding, here's a memory. And so I tested my B12 levels and I basically had no B12 left in my body. And so I was starting to have neuropathy and, you know, burning mouth syndrome and things like that. Um, and within like mm, probably about two to three months of taking B12 shots on a consistent basis, it went away. So did a bunch of other health problems that I was having um, and then we fell down the rabbit hole of pernicious anemia and you know having to take b12 shots for the rest of your life situation um but you know uh, find the root cause of it topically for neuropathy i also like a cayenne based salve um she's really fantastic for oh this sounds scary to people but she overwhelms your nerve endings you don't feel it happening but like she overwhelms nerve endings so they stop sending signals to your brain about the pain but that's how most pain medication works. They're doing something to either overwhelm the nerves or block their ability to send pain. So it doesn't, it's not as scary as it sounds. It's just that people don't realize that's how these things work topically. Um, question, where did you, I get my ancestry test done? Years and years and years ago, I got it off of ancestry like the, the original one, and that was like over a decade ago. And I wasn't really happy with it. Well, I mean, I was happy with it then. I'm not happy that they have decided to like, they change my results constantly, and they try to say that they're like updating things, but it's really interesting to see the things that they're deciding to remove from my ancestry. And then if I upload my raw data to like Family Tree, you know, or these other places, I'm like, oh, Turns out I'm still that, but Ancestry has decided to just strip that away. And I've seen people talking about it on Reddit being like, wow, uh, suddenly they took this part of my ancestry away, right? And even though you've got records confirming that your ancestors are from that area or from whatever, you're like, I have proof of it. They're like, nah, you're not that no more. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's really interesting. So I'm not happy with it in that way. I know that science changes and they, they're getting bigger samplings from groupings and stuff, but some of it's just wild, man. Some of it's just like, they're taking too much of things away for it to make sense, especially when the other places are detecting it and you have records to back it up. It just doesn't make sense. Um, question, tips on how to ship bombs and heat to keep arriving melted. You've got to get yourself thermal mailers and you've got to ask, um, or if you're probably shipping them yourself if you're not using a ship fulfillment company, thermal mailers and ice packs and um, if they're going to be purchasing a balm or a salve in the summertime, it has to be priority, right? And so typically what I used to do is I would increase the cost for summertime shipping, right? Because you had to cover the cost of the thermal mailer and the ice pack and the shipping it quickly. Um, and then you need to have a policy to where like, you need to keep an eye on your mailbox. Like 
you can't have this like you know it's coming you need to not let it sit in your mailbox until the evening time and then get mad at me when it's melted <laughs> right because the thermal mailer and stuff can only do so much um and then up your beeswax quantity and your bombs and yourselves in the summertime you have to adjust the level because if you barely have any in the salve, it'll melt like that. You know, you can you can increase it and it'll still melt, but it takes a little longer because it's denser. It has more beeswax and oil, right? Um, question to piggyback on feet. Constant pain. Thought it was plantar fasciitis, but maybe a tribal nerve. Thoughts about this if it's related to low thyroid. It could be. Um, but also, everybody's feet are fucked up from the shoes we wear. It's not normal to have um, constant like support on your arch and to squeeze your shoes in and to walk like this. Like you weren't born like on a low key like high heel, but especially women, all of our shoes are raised up. I would look into very slowly transitioning into zero drop shoes and once you fall into that rabbit hole you'll start seeing how people are like working to like repair the muscles in their feet so my feet used to be so bad that it would hurt if i stood for more than four or five minutes on bare feet in the house right and it was like from years of like being homeless and walking literally hundreds of miles throughout my teen years in shitty shoes, right? But even nice shoes continue to cause issues. And so um, I started um, transitioning to zero drop shoes, which means that there's zero lift and they're wide so your toes can actually spread like they're supposed to be. And it's been like three years now and I don't have any foot pain. I can just stand in the kitchen barefoot with no problems. It doesn't hurt to walk for a long ways. Um, and so that is something that I would definitely look into um, on top of like making sure that your like nutrition is on point. But I think that most people who are having foot pain are having foot pain because we wear shoes that deform our feet. <laughs> right you know and it adds up and it's always worse for women it is always worse for women like think about a high heel that is literal like torture to wear even a semi heel even anything where our shoes are always lifted way more and they're always way smaller and they make our toes go like that they're horrible for you um question can you mix cayenne and castor oil together for a wrap you could i would just put far less cayenne than you think you need when people are like oh i made a cayenne salve but it burns when i put it on I'm like how much did you put in that <laughs> in fact this weekend i'm going to show everybody how to make a cayenne salve because people have been asking a lot about that um and it's super easy and i like to make an infused oil and then strain the cayenne out personally right so you could do the same thing you could make an infused castor oil but i know people want to use it right now right they don't want to wait for the infusion process so i'll go over how they can do it without using the infusion process and it needs to be far less right um but yeah uh cayenne with castor would work well just less than you think you need um question 24 year old with excessive sweating thyroid test came back fine doctors don't have any insight on it you need more electrolytes in your body so one thing that people think that they're like oh don't eat salt it'll dehydrate you i'm like actually salt is hypercritical for keeping fluids in our body right like you don't want to like drink nothing but ocean water by all means but typically if we have excessive sweating going on and i know that there are conditions that can cause this but if they've ruled that out and they're like you're just sweating you probably need electrolytes in your body right now now you need to start working with a really high quality salt i like celtic salt redmond's is fine too but i like celtic because um it had like the celtic sea salt has way more nutrients like it's not just sodium right there's magnesium there's potassium there's selenium and all these things you could check out my electrolyte video um you could buy an electrolyte mix from somewhere high quality but just getting that sodium and that magnesium and that potassium those trace minerals back in your body will likely help ease up some of that excess sweating because without sodium you fluid dump Without sodium, you pee all the time. You sweat all the time. You're just dripping constantly, right? Because there's nothing helping your bod body retain the water, right? And then we're like, need more water because I sweat all the time. And then people make themselves deficient 
all the time by drinking too much water because our water doesn't have minerals in it anymore right and so we're like drink water drink water drink water and then you're just flushing out flushing out flushing out all of your minerals and then you're told to be terrified of salt and so you don't put enough salt in your food and things like that and then before you know it you're sweating constantly and you're tired all the time and you're having leg cramps and you're having digestive issues and you're just exhausted because you have no electrolytes in your body. Um, okay. So I've, uh, talked over the 30 minutes. <laughs> I tried to answer a bunch more questions today. I know I missed a bunch. Again, if I didn't get to you, definitely consider going and rewatching like the many literal hours I have of Q and A's. I used to do like two, three, long like two or three hour long q a so there's no shortage of being able to watch me brain dump about situations and i've probably answered your question i do these every friday with my tea time so i'll have you know it again tomorrow or not tomorrow tomorrow <laughs> on friday still in puppy brain um so don't be bummed out if I didn't answer your question. If you would like to support my capacity to teach freely, to share what's in my brain, to have tea, to be a human with you and all that kind of stuff, consider becoming a member. It's a way to just throw me a couple extra bucks a month to help support my ability to exist. And you get early access to videos if I make them early in the week and upload them. <laughs> I don't always get around to making them in the weekday, but if you can't afford that, don't worry. These videos always get published to all on the weekend, so you're not like having anything hidden behind a paywall um you could also call things home from my apothecary i make all kinds of herbal synergism blends i've got books i've got tooth powder i got all kinds of stuff to choose from you can use the one-time code tea time t-e-a-t-i-m-e -E, to save 10 percent off of your order and all of it exclusively supports my capacity to teach freely and be here with you. If you can't do any of that, or even if you can, it's really helpful and important that you like, comment, share, subscribe, and turn on notifications. Sharing is super helpful because it helps other people realize that they are smart enough to do this too. It helps get my work out there and all that kind of stuff. And it's just a really big way to support me if you definitely, if you can't support me financially, that also really helps. So thank you so much for watching folks and I'll see you on Monday's live tea time and a video tomorrow and a short later today. <laughs> so we'll see you later folks, bye.